Good morning, everybody. I see folks coming into the virtual space. We'll just give everybody a moment to get settled and we'll get things started. Always lo love watching the participant numbers tick up. <laughs> All right, Linda, you want to get going? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, and welcome, or good good morning, or good afternoon, everyone, uh, depending on where you're joining from. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the first dialogue in the Women in Energy Transformation series. This is, as you know, a special four-part series being brought to you in partnership between the Pemina Institute and the GLOBE series. This year-long national initiative will explore the role of women in all aspects of Canada's transformation to a net zero energy economy. For those of you not familiar with the term net zero, it refers to putting no more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere than we are capable of removing from it. So in other words, essentially zeroing out emissions. And as we all know, it's a goal that Canada and most other countries in the world have committed to by 2050. Uh, one other further point of clarification here, why are we using the term transformation instead of energy transition for this series? And the answer is because Canada faces the challenge of not just moving from an old energy system to a new one, the journey to a net zero emissions future also requires reshaping the way energy is produced, transported and consumed. So my name is Linda Cody and I'm the executive director of the Pemina Institute, an environmental nonprofit think tank on climate and energy issues based out of the province of Alberta. We are partnering with Globe Series to host this project because our two organizations share the belief that gender equity and inclusion has the potential to be a powerful and unifying force for a more inclusive and uh, future climate and energy future for Canada. So I'm really excited to be co-hosting this event with my colleague from GLOBE, Elizabeth Shirt. Elizabeth? Hi, everybody, and, and welcome. As my good friend Linda mentioned, I'm Elizabeth Shirt. I'm Managing Director of GLOBE Series, an organization that brings people together to advance our vision of achieving a more sustainable, prosperous, and socially just future in one generation. And of course, we're best known for our flagship event, Globe Forum, held every other year in Vancouver. I have the privilege of co-hosting today's event alongside Linda, and I'm thrilled to share we had over 580 people register for this virtual dialogue, of which over 70% identify as women. Um, I see we're, we're uh, starting to push up to 200 uh, folks at attending today and we know we have participants from all over Canada, the US and, and even further abroad including Singapore, the Netherlands, Morocco, Australia, South Africa and, and Nigeria. Uh, so super excited to have you all here today. Um, before we begin, uh, we believe it's important to acknowledge that many of us joining uh, the session from Canada are settlers on land that is the traditional, ancestral, and often unceded territory of a diversity of Indigenous peoples, including First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. Um, this act of acknowledging the land and, and the signed treaties were applicable is an act of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples in Canada, and it, it's an expression of respect and of gratitude for the land. The action is to remind us that our places of work, where we live and, and where we gather, are on the traditional lands of Indigenous peoples who resided here historically and, and still do today. And while it's tremendously important uh, that tomorrow has been formally set aside as the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation in Canada, this act of acknowledging the land is also a recognition that all of us are accountable to these relationships on a daily basis, not just one day a year. So I would encourage you to take a moment and consider your connection to the land where you're joining from. Uh, and, and please feel free to share 
in the chat box, uh, that connection. We're also sharing in the chat now a wonderful resource uh, called nativeland.ca. And I'd encourage you to check out this resource and learn more about your connection with the land uh, that where you reside and its, its traditional peoples and its meaning. Uh, Linda and I, of course, are joining you today from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam nations, also known as Vancouver. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, well, just to give you a little bit of a history here, today's event dates back to a conversation that Elizabeth and I had in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic and shutdown, the initial shutdown here. And we were both relatively new to our roles and we both felt strongly about the disproportionate impact the pandemic was having on women in the workforce. So we decided that there was one thing we could do about that, and, and it would be to find ways to connect more women with those sectors of the energy economy that will be growing as Canada's energy systems decarbonize and diversify to become net zero. At Pemina Institute, where I work, has had also been doing some recent work regarding the role of, role of women in the energy sector in Alberta that indicated that women are more likely to engage on climate issues. And we now know for sure that women's voices are critical to energy systems change. Studies by universities across Canada and the US have found that women are more likely to believe in climate change and to act on climate change, be it in their careers, their homes, their communities, or through their purchasing and investment decisions, as well as their decisions on who to vote for. Of course, having spent much of our careers working in the industry, Linda and I were also both intimately aware of some of the barriers and challenges uh, that women and, and other represent, underrepresented groups in the energy sectors have historically faced and, and still face today. And, and we wanted to challenge some of the stereotypes by elevating the profile of women who are driving change in Canada's energy systems. We believe that the desire to build back better from the pandemic and, and the absolute imperative to get Canada on the path to net zero greenhouse gas emissions will combine to create new and super exciting opportunities for participation in the clean energy infrastructure economy of the future. So throughout this series, we will be bringing you the stories and experience and insights of women taking climate action across different energy sources, systems, value change, cultures, and generations. And in the process, we also hope to communicate tangible career pathways, or at least to put them forward for young and aspiring women, many of whom we hope are with us today, who want to participate in shaping Canada's energy future at many different levels. The energy transformation needs action from all of us. And we want to acknowledge at the outset that this requires accelerated change in leadership on the part of women in our traditional energy industries, such as oil and gas, as well as in electricity, buildings, transportation and technology, nonprofits, academia, governments, including local and indigenous communities. The point is people working across all of these areas have a lot to contribute. The reality is that working together is going to be the best way to create the energy systems of the future. So we encourage you to lean into this conversation today to engage actively through the chat, to share your thoughts and learn from the stories and successes of others and support one another's experience, both the good and the bad. We are keen to hear your views and thoughts. We ask only that you share them respectfully and that you also take the time to listen, be open to all options, views, and experiences that might be shared here today. So with this in mind, uh, we'd like to start by getting a sense of where you, the audience, are coming from on some of these critical topics and issues. So in a moment, uh, you're gonna see a poll appearing on your screen and uh, we'd encourage you to share the answer to the question. Uh, to you, what is the most important characteristic for a successful energy transformation? Is it achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions? Is it a just transformation where no one is left behind? Uh, is it a significant increase of women or, or other underrepresented groups uh, in the energy sectors? Uh, is it um, 
moving away from Canada's reliance on fossil fuels, or is it achieving actually net negative greenhouse gas emissions, so going beyond net zero? So love to hear your thoughts uh, on this. And uh, in just a moment, we'll, we'll share the results of the poll on screen uh, so you can see what some of your peers are feeling on this topic. All right, let's see, let's see those results coming in. Do we have the results to share? <laughs> there they are. Excellent. They are. <laughs> Excellent. So a real mix of, uh, of views on this um, and, and very uh, interesting and exciting given our topic this morning that that just transformation uh, comes out, stands out as, uh, as, as the most important uh, component of, of energy transformation. Yeah, let, let's hear it for not leaving anybody behind in this process. So thanks for responding to that first poll. Now in a moment, you should see a second poll appearing on your screen. And we'd uh, like to know your thoughts on, on this next question. Uh, in your opinion, is your or, uh, how committed is your current organization to gender equity in the workplace? A score of one means that your organization is, is not all that committed, while a score of five means that your it, organization is, is, is clearly committed, taking significant action really on it. So we'll give everybody a few moments here. And of course, these responses are totally confidential and anonymous. So, uh, so none of us can see how you respond to these questions. We wanna hear your, um, hear your, your thoughts on this one. It's awesome to see so many people um, joining in the chat, sharing where they're joining from, sharing your land acknowledgements. I see folks joining everywhere from, from Halifax, across through uh, Montreal, Quebec. Uh, saw somebody online from Nigeria who's gonna be moving to Toronto. So thanks so much for, for engaging in the chat and using that mechanism. Okay, so we got some. So we have a number of people from organizations who are on it, 36%. <clears throat> clearly this is an issue that's uh, coming up for everyone. We had a question in the chat of how many people have responded. It, it looks like about 175 responded, uh, right around that number responded to the poll. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, thank you for responding to these initial polls to get this process going. And now it's time to start on the good stuff, our storytellers. We are really pleased to be featuring four incredible women today who come from a diversity of backgrounds and experiences on climate and energy issues. In a few moments, you're going to hear directly from them in a series of rapid fire interviews while they share their stories and perspectives. And then following the interviews, we'll have some time for some audience Q&A. So be thinking of questions that you'd like to ask our storytellers. And please, again, as Elizabeth has said, use the chat throughout the interviews and throughout this event to engage with one another and share your thoughts. Elizabeth? Yeah, thanks, Linda. And, and of course, I, I want to acknowledge that this dialogue series would, would not be possible without support from key sponsors and partners who are helping us make it happen. And we're fortunate today to be joined by representatives from our four presenting sponsors of the Women in Energy Transformation series, amazing women uh, of the energy transformation in their own right. And, and these four representatives will be joining us on screen to interview our, our featured storytellers in that, in that series of cascading uh, rapid fire interviews. Um, so the interviews you're going to be seeing on screen in just a moment, uh, uh, representing our presenting sponsors include uh, Molly Johnson, Assistant Deputy Minister, Low Carbon Energy at Natural Resources Canada, Michelle George, Vice President of Engineering uh, and Storage and Transmission Operations at Enbridge, Brianne Fox, uh, Director of Commercial Management and Carbon Technology at Capital Power, and Rona Delferrari, Chief Sustainability Officer and Senior Vice President of Stakeholder Engagement with Synovus. Okay, so it's now our pleasure to invite Molly Johnson from Anarchan to join us on the screen, Molly, and Elizabeth and I will exit here and to kick things off with our, fir our first featured storyteller. Molly, uh, over to you. Fantastic. 
Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, thank you, Linda, so much. I'm really delighted to be here today to celebrate such an inspiring group of women. Um, it's, you know, just hearing the introduction and the issues that we're talking about uh, today, it's, it's sort of, it, you can relax into kind of being with your people and talking about the issues that are really important to us in our future. Um, I'm speaking to you today from Ottawa, the unceded territory of the uh, Algonquin Anishinaabeg Nation. Um, and I have the great pleasure of kicking off our first rapid fire interview with Kehakasha. Um, and, uh, and I think if I could invite you to come on screen, I'm sorry, I'm in a little bit of a small view here. Um, just to see if you have joined me on the screen. There you are, hi, and we're meeting for the first time. So it's very nice to meet you. It's so, uh, yeah. And so uh, Kea Kasha is the founder and president of the Green Hope Foundation, which works at, um, at grass, a grassroots level in 25 countries, empowering young people, especially those from vulnerable communities in the sustainable development process. She has an impressive list of accomplishments. She's been named a Forbes, Forbes 30 under 30, is one of Canada's top 25 women of influence, and she's the winner of the 2016 International Children's Peace Prize. I think we all know that recognition is wonderful and it's the gravy and it's the thing we love, but it's the true joy in what we do is the work and it's the result. And she works tirelessly to amplify the voices of women and girls in the decision-making processes. So we're so pleased to have you here today. Um, this is rapid fire, so I'm gonna you know, do the usual as fast as humanly possible. So my first question is to ask you to tell us about a big or small action that you have taken in your career to advance the role of women in the energy transformation. Thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, it's wonderful to be here today. And you know, to answer uh, the question, my work uses clean energy as a tool for reducing inequality amongst our world's most marginalized communities that I work with, especially those in least developed countries. And at my organization, Green Hope Foundation, one of our projects is, uh, for instance, amongst an indigenous rural community in Western India with the women in these households being forced to work as daily wage earners and the girls in the families having to drop out of school to tend to their siblings as well as cook using firewood as their parents go out and search for work. So not only only are they missing out on education, the exposure to the polluted fumes while cooking has also led to asthma, other respiratory ailments, and to really address these integrated issues of health, education, gender inequality, and energy, we've given solar cookers to these households, providing training as well as education that on clean energy that helps to bring about behavioral change. And these self-cooking solar cookers also uh, allows the, women, the girls to resume their education while removing the polluting fumes from their homes. And in other LDCs like Bangladesh and Liberia, we're using innovative clean energy solutions to bridge the digital divide. So our solar grids are powering homes, community centers, schools, uh, bringing light into the lives of hundreds of people in these villages, like who even in this 21st century don't uh, have uh, any kind of electricity. And with COVID especially, these schools have been shut for more than a year and have now resumed digital education. And these villages now have solar powered streetlights that provide women and girls with the safety that allows them to venture out at night. And our mobile library project that runs on solar power is taking the library directly to the doorstep in their homes in far from villages that's going to now educate over 250,000 children with a special focus on girls. I did the full COVID thing where I started talking and there's mute, I apologize. Uh, that's amazing, thank you. And you know, Linda sort of noticed that off the top that the unique barriers that affect women, um, you know, in energy, in the energy transformation. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how you became aware of the gender imbalances that are present in the energy sector. And, you know, so how this impacted you, your career choices and the contributions that, uh, that you've clearly made uh, through your work. 
Yeah, you know, as a young woman engaged in the sustainable development process for more than a decade, I can definitely uh, say that I've encountered gender gaps, biases in all spheres, be it at the grassroots level or in the highest echelons of policy making. And it's really not restricted to the energy sector. And this tradition of male dominance is very much evident and on the same scale, if not more, in the energy domain as well. So, you know, back in 2014, I was 13 years old and I was recognized by a clean energy company for my work on engaging young people in helping them transition to uh, clean and renewable energy. And at the awards ceremony, I was uh, amazed in a negative way to find myself to be the only female awardee. And there were hardly any women in the audience. And the general erroneous impression uh, being that, you know, clean energy, then the clean energy sector was too technologically advanced for women to be a part of. And unfortunately, this wasn't an isolated case. This was something that I saw at so many different UN conferences as well on clean energy. And only now in just like the last couple of years, maybe we're seeing a slight change, but you know, that's definitely not been the case earlier. But instead of being intimidated, it actually motivated me to accelerate my impact so that it will be my work that will be doing the talking and there's been no stopping since then. And I can proudly say that at Green Hope Foundation, our leadership is 99% women and we all work tirelessly in the clean energy sector. That's amazing. And, and just pushing boundaries within your zone of control. It's so fantastic to see. Um, so I get asked this question sometimes and I try and think about it as well. So if you had the power to sort of make one big change to ensure that Canada's energy transformation is successful and the role of women is at the core of that, um, you know, putting on your ruler for a day kind of hat, what would, uh, what would that be? Yeah, you know, I'd say that the biggest change that I'd want to ensure for that successful energy transformation, I think, is for the removal of fossil fuel subsidies and investing that in building the necessary infrastructure for the usage of the clean renewable energy. And, you know, Canada as a developed country with a relatively small population, we need to harness the advantages that we possess by leading this transformation. And we also need to ensure that we plan ahead and really take account of those people whose livelihoods are linked to the fossil fuel industry and ensure that they're provided with the skill sets and opportunities to transition into new roles in the clean energy sector so that the process is really equitable for all stakeholders. And I'd also like to add that we need education about clean energy practices. There are a lot of people in our country who are still unaware of where uh, their energy comes from and are actually scared to shift to clean energy because of a lack of knowledge and also of the fear that clean energy is more expensive. So, you know, education on clean energy will help us to bridge that divide. And most importantly, it'll ensure that girls and women can take their rightful places in the clean energy sector. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Um, I had this little note that says, share final reflections, but there's nothing that I could say that could top your inspiring words. So with that, um, it's now my pleasure to pass the baton over to Michelle George for our next woman in the energy transformation story. Thank you so much and a pleasure to, uh, to speak with you today. Thanks, Molly, and hello, everyone. I'm, I'm very excited to be here representing Enbridge. I'm joining from Toronto, Ontario, which is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas credit. Um, we jumped at the opportunity to support this dialogue series to put a spotlight not just on the energy transformation, but the women who are shaping it and the diverse perspectives that they bring. Transforming our energy systems presents a huge opportunity to move to a low carbon future, but it also poses some big challenges. And that is what me and my team at, at Enbridge Gas think about daily. We're advancing low carbon solutions like hydrogen and renewable natural gas to green Ontario's grid. Overall, Enbridge's role is to safely deliver energy that millions of North Americans rely on every day. And we're committed to building a bridge to a cleaner, more sustainable energy future. It's so inspiring to be here to meet the women who are driving the energy transition and learn from their experiences. And I have the pleasure of interviewing Heather Campbell. 
Heather, if you want to join me on the screen, Heather has a diverse career with technical policy and business roles in a full range of energy industries. She's now the executive director of clean technology with Alberta Innovates, the province's largest research and innovation agency. Heather holds an engineering degree and a master of law degree in energy law and policy. And she's a lifelong community volunteer with a range of organizations from the Performing Arts, Academia, the Anglican Church, the Calgary Police Commission. She's also the former co-chair of Alberta's Anti-Racism Advisory Council. It's great to meet you, Heather. Thanks very much, Michelle. <laughs> so, so in this rapid fire approach, can you start by telling us what was the aha moment when you knew you had to be part of, the, of Canada's energy transformation? Absolutely. Thanks very much. Um, I was working with a petrochemical co company here in Calgary, and a colleague asked me to contribute some information on enhanced oil recovery and carbon capture storage and utilization to a white paper for a standing policy committee for the federal government on environment and state sustainability. And I loved it. Um, that I could contribute my technical knowledge, my engineering expertise, and be a bridge to the energy policy side of things, which consequently led me to pursue my second degree in energy law and policy, was just fantastic. Um, it, for me, it really spoke to how I was raised. Um, my mother very specifically sought to have me be what was in the old days called well-rounded and <laughs> to evaluate issues from a set of diverse perspectives and that I was able to provide advice and perspective uh, to government on behalf of my employer with respect to sustainability. And this is at a time when we had only probably been using that word sustainability for about 10 years. Um, this was gold for me. Um, the remainder of my career was, has been dedicated to clean technology, renewable energy, innovation and technology development to reduce emissions and achieve uh, sustainability goals. What a great journey, thank you. Uh, so, so if you had the power to make one big change right now um, to ensure energy's, Canada's energy transformation is successful, what would it be for you? So it's ensuring that Canada's, Alberta's and Calgary's energy transformation is authentically inclusive. Having women, um, incremental women in STEM fields like you and me, <laughs> like you and me Michelle, um, is especially, and especially in engineering, in my view, will facilitate women participating in and leading the energy transformation. Many of the solutions that are required for energy transformation are engineering solutions. Um, as an example, um, energy storage and the corresponding technology development to enable it can it contribute to energy independence, energy access, energy equity, and particularly for Indigenous and remote communities. Um, women are drawn to clean technology in a high percentage, um, relatively speaking, but are st still significantly underrepresented in clean technology overall. Um, a 2019 report by the International Renewable Energy Agency found that women make up 32% of the renewable energy workforce globally. Now that exceeds women's representation in traditional energy sectors, but the same report also noted that most women in the sector hold administrative roles rather than specialized technical roles like you and I do that provide a stronger basis for career advancement. So when I think about a pandemic that we're still in, um, that has so dramatically impacted women, people of color, and those who live the intersectional realities of those identifiers. Oh, hey, not a kooky academic theory at all. Um, clean technology and energy transformation is our opportunity to build back better. And in my world, better means inclusive. That's awesome. That, it's so, so true and so awesome. And I completely agree on, the, on, on, on all of it. Um, so, so knowing what you know today, what would you tell yourself on day one of your career in the energy sector? Probably two things. One, there's more coming to you than just this plant in Sarnia, Ontario. Be patient. Opportunities and a diverse set of opportunities will show themselves to you like the colors of a Paul Gauguin painting. Two, you have a wage gap with your five male new engineering graduate colleagues who started on the same day as you in June 1996. Fix it now. 
amazing. And, and I have to say, my career started in June of 1995, so totally relatable, all of, all of what you're talking about. We, we, um, have, okay. we, have, we, have, we have two degrees of separation, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, okay, last question. Can you talk about a moment when you became aware of the gender imbalances? I think you shared one um, present in the energy sector, and how did that change your career? How did you do, what did you do about it? So my late father worked for Shell Canada as a chemical technologist. So that meant I knew what a gas chromatograph was at 11 years old. And I watched my dad set up experiments on a mass spec before I had even taken a chemistry class or even heard of advanced mathematics. Um, one of my dad's colleagues, her name was Brenda, um, was a research scientist. And the summer I turned 13, I babysat for Brenda and her husband. And my father and Brenda carpooled um, to the research center. Um, one of my co father's colleagues was a woman. One. Um, every single engineer at the Oakville Research Center, which is now closed, and every engineer I was introduced to outside of my father's workplace was male. My paternal family is littered with engineers, all working in various and different sectors of the energy industry. Out of eight engineers in my family, I am still the only woman. So what do I do about it? Um, my team at Alberta Innovates, my clean technology team at Alberta Innovates is 80% women. Um, I don't allow mammals. So a panel composed entirely of men in anything in which I choose to participate. Um, I probably have a really unusual obsession with sustainable aviation fuels. Um, <laughs> Um, and I'm called to speak about clean technology in the broadest sense, um, beyond my core engineering discipline of chemical and biochemical engineering. Um, so I've had to grow my knowledge base in other sectors like electricity and renewables and power generation on the job. And that's actually been really satisfying to have that continuous learning piece attached to my work. That's amazing. Excellent. Thank you so much, Heather. So insightful. Um, so inspirational. Thank you very much. And it is now my pleasure to hand things over to Brianne Fox of Capital Power for our next Women in Energy Transformation story. Brianne, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Michelle. And uh, welcome to everybody online. I think we have a really amazing turnout for this for this online conference. And if anyone else is the same as me, I'm very much looking forward to the day where we can see each other in person as opposed to talking to computer screens. So to keep the amazing stories going, uh, please welcome Alexandra Tavasoli, the CEO and CTO of Solistra. Alex is a PhD chemical engineer who studies strategies through which greenhouse gases can be recycled and reused in existing petrochemical processes to reduce their reliance on fossil fuel resources. She currently, currently leads Solistra, a company devoted to solar-driven chemical processes that recycle carbon dioxide into base commodity chemicals. Previously, she was in new product in introductions at Agfa Gavart and Advanced Energy Center at the Mars Discovery District. So welcome, Alex. Hi, Brianne. Thanks everyone for having me today. So some of the similar questions, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna check my camera, you can't see me. Some of the similar questions we've already heard and some really amazing stories. What was the aha moment for you when you just knew you had to be part of Canada's energy transformation? Um, well, for me, I originally became interested in a sustainability career when I was in high school, but um, it wasn't really clear what uh, form that was gonna take. And I ultimately, as, as Heather just mentioned, um, I ended up doing chemical engineering because it it really gave me the, the opportunity to engage in large systems analysis and really understand how all this, all our energy networks and resource use is connected to one another and uh, uh, work rationally towards um, optimizing those systems. But more specifically, the thing that attracted me to being part of the energy transition was that everybody is part of the energy transition, whether we want to be or not. And um, the urgency of it of transitioning our energy and transforming our economy is becoming more and more evident because the only the only constant in our climate modeling is that our climate modeling is too conservative and that the emergency is closer than we we think it is. Um, 
And so that that's really what interests me about being part of the energy transition is that it touches every part of everybody's daily life. And um, we, we can't really think about things like weaning off of fossil fuels without thinking about how we're transforming our food systems. How are we building our communities that use heat, heat and, and electricity power uh, more efficiently? Um, and we're, we're seeing this play out in real time around the world with um, things like the natural gas shortage that's expected to come in Europe that's causing their fertilizer plants to go off grid. Um, China is having issues with coal, coal shortages that is, are affecting its manufacturing sector. And so the thinking about the energy transformation really spills over into the need for more sustainable systems, which is what, what interests me. And um, right now where we are in this transition, it's the, the problem that keeps on giving. So there's so much work for everybody to do. Um, and so I would encourage those of you thinking about getting into the sustainability sector to jump in and find a place because there's definitely a place for you, even if you're not technical. Yeah, that's awesome. I, you know, I think your comment around the impact of daily life, um, it really resonates with me and I'm sure a lot of people on the call here today. So knowing what you know today, what would you tell yourself on day one of your career? Um, <laughs> I probably tell my younger self to take smaller bites, you'll eventually get there. But um, uh, in a broader sense, um, I would say that there's no, there's no silver bullet climate solution. Um, so for example, I like to use the example that refining the metals that we use in wind turbines actually produces radioactive waste. So there's always a, there's a, always a give and take with every solution that we have. And as the, the discourse around what we should do with the energy transition has developed, um, we are finding a lot of arguments like, the blue versus green hydrogen um, argument or whether direct air capture is worth it as a technology. And I really think that um, um, I would tell myself at the beginning of my career that we really need all of these things and that we're probably uh, prematurely splitting hairs where in reality, we will need a combination of these strategies. So my younger self was more, um, more attuned to the the, the gobbets, the, the catchphrases of, you know, remove fossil fuel subsidies, but we, we have to think about, you know, if we remove fossil fuel subsidies and food prices skyrocket, we end up subsidizing food prices, that's sort of the same thing. So we really need to be attacking this from a, a systems perspective. Um, and also I would tell myself, a younger person, that um, the transition is going to be expensive. I think a lot of us are waiting for these technologies to somehow be cheaper than fossil fuels, but um, fossil fuels were just a gift from the earth and nothing's going to be cheaper than that. So we have to uh, put in place our economic um, strategies and policies and regulations to, um, to make that transition more economically palatable. Very, very well said. I like that, a gift from the earth. Yeah. Okay, and then the last question, which you know, is maybe the, the superhero question of the day that I think a number of uh, speakers will be speaking to, is if you had that power, you know, I'll say that superhero power to make one big change right now, maybe regardless of dollars or, you know, what would that be? Um, and, you know, what would we need to do to make our energy transformation successful? Right. So keeping dollars in mind, um, <laughs> the, um, I really think that the, um, uh, we, we need to transition our regulatory system in such a way that we're, we're bounding our economic system so that the, the, the business leaders who are, whose job it is to capitalize that economic system are working within bounds that will lead us to a green economy. So for example, um, I think that if we could increase taxes on emissions while simultaneously putting a cap on fuel prices so that, you know, as I mentioned before, the food, food sector doesn't go out of control and our goods and services don't become very expensive. I think that those two policies simultaneously could um, incentivize the business community enough to move away from um, investing in more fossil fuel resources. And in the mid 70s and mid 80s, Canada did have a cap on fuel prices um, that we eventually got rid of in the mid 80s for the very reason that they, um, they don't incentivize investment into the fossil fuel sector, which is, you know, was a, a negative thing in the mid eighties, but is potentially a positive thing now. Um, and so again, the job of those business leaders is to capitalize on those systems. So let's give them a sustainable system that they can work within um, to capitalize there. Um, 
And yes, I think the costs that those private sectors are going to incur is going to be, um, should be reflective of the cost that it, that effects of climate change have on our economy. So Rebecca Henderson from Harvard University, she writes a lot about this reimagining capitalism idea of how to, of the, the real costs fossil fuels have in our economy and how those should be reflected in uh, regulatory practices. So I would, I would change the, the regulatory structure to trickle down the, the sustainability incentives. Fair, yeah, and you, I mean, you can't ignore the costs. That's what makes the, makes the world go round in some extent, so. Yeah, awesome. yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Alex, for you know, your insight as well as your contribution to the industry. I think this stuff is really very, very important. Uh, next up, please join me in welcoming our next speaker who Rona Delfari will introduce. Thanks, Brianne. Such fabulous insights from all of these inspirational women. So I'm pleased to be here representing Synovus Energy and our company is committed to being part of the energy transformation and to indigenous reconciliation. That makes me very happy to introduce the extremely impressive Jordan Burnoff. Jordan, please join us now. Jordan is a member of Black Lake First Nation. She grew up in the Métis community of Isla La Crosse in Saskatchewan. I may be one of the few people here who knows where that is because that's my home province too. And I grew up in Cut Knife, just a bit farther south. So Jordan is uh, an advisor to the uh, vice president of the Métis Nation of Saskatchewan. And she's a senior associate with the consulting company, Medicine Rope Strategies. She has a strong passion for and relationship with the land and her work is centered on clean energy and environmental initiatives with a focus on land-based teachings, cultural inclusion and youth engagement. That's quite the portfolio. Jordan is leading her community's energy efficiency project as part of Indigenous Clean Energy's national initiative, Bringing It Home. The focus is on addressing the housing and energy needs of First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities in Canada. Jordan continues to advocate and create space for youth and women in the energy sector in Canada as co-chair of the 7 Gen Indigenous Youth Council, as a member of the Indigenous Clean Energy Board of Directors and Efficiency Canada's Governing Council. Wow, I have no idea how you have time to even be here today. So thanks for joining us, Jordan. First question over to you. Bring us back to that moment when you realized that you wanted to be a part of Canada's energy transformation. Okay, back to that. Um, you know, it was a really empowering time when I, I, I knew, you know, this, that I wanted this to be a career. I always knew I was interested in um, environmental work and, you know, being a part of um, the bigger socioeconomic uh, conversation and community. And I think that's what really led me to energy in the first place was, okay, I look at you know, my community and see some of the social issues that, that people are affected by and, and individuals, you know, growing up, I, I've experienced suicide, um, youth incarceration rates in Indigenous communities is absolutely uh, staggering. And so with those things in mind, I think, you know, I was able to attend a few energy conferences, and that's really where my mind opened up to having this as a career. And I was a part of a conversation, um, a, an engagement, I guess, an engagement strategy where Indigenous youth were, you know, okay, so what are the barriers on employment and engaging in Indigenous youth in the energy sector? And so that was the big question. And we had about an hour with a number of different organizations. And that really opened my eyes to see, okay, people really have no idea about what, uh, you know, effective engagement looks like. And I think too often, especially in Indigenous communities, you know, there's like the, the tokenization of, of roles and of people. And I think that was what happened. And I was like, okay, how can I help this? You know, and not that it comes from a place of, of weakness for organizations to not know the appropriate process, but now, how do we take some of that power back and say, okay, we need to actively be involved in these conversations and how do we do that, you know? So um, I pitched an idea and, um, you know, someone saw the, the spark, I guess, and fire in my eye to do something. And, and uh, so then 
I got involved in uh, the 2020 Catalyst program with Indigenous Clean Energy, and that's kind of where it all started. Um, the initial, I guess my initial um, experience with that began with 7Gen, and that's the first ever Indigenous Youth um, Summit on energy. And so, you know, from that point, it just kind of snowballed and I got more and more involved and I absolutely just loved it. And I was able to see, okay, you know, going back to those socioeconomic factors that, that affect communities, now this is an industry where everything trickles down to that, right? It all starts with energy and that's where you can make a really huge impact. And I was able to see that in that, in that situation. Well, I can understand why that person saw that spark and, and decided to pursue you. I pursue your idea and I'm glad that they did. And I'm also interested to know a bit more about your thoughts on gender imbalances in the energy sector in particular and how that has shaped what you've been working on. Mm -hmm. Well, and my experience with, with the energy industry goes, goes way back, you know, I'm from Northern Saskatchewan and, and as people know, that is kind of the, one of the biggest uranium exploration and and production sites in you know the world and so I've grown up seeing exploration and uranium companies coming in and out of our community uh non-stop and I was actually a recipient of scholarships from those organizations or those companies and I had an opportunity to work as a summer student for a number of years, but my first year, just fresh out of high school, you know, starting a summer student position. And I was in the, the office with HR of this, of this uh, uranium company. And it was an older lady and she, she's like, okay, so nice to meet you. Great to have you here. Just so you know, um, there's a lot of men in our camps and you're going to be in situations where you're very uncomfortable and people are going to say things to you that you might not necessarily like. And then back then, you know, being a young woman, I was like, okay, yeah, like th that happens. And in retrospect, I'm like, that was my first introduction to first day on the job, you know, in that environment, I was being prepared that that environment was not safe for me, but I needed to prepare for that, you know? And so that has molded so much of, of what I do and, and the space that I try to make, especially for Indigenous women, you know, the energy industry, there are so many ties to missing and murdered Indigenous women um, and the industry and, you know, and the connection that Indigenous women have to the environment and to land, that's something that we need to think about in the work that we do every day, you know, and it's, it's not just a matter of thinking of these things in an isolated uh, ma manner. We need to actually look at these calls to justice and how do we action them? You know, how do we action the TRC's calls to action? And, you know, as Elizabeth said, it's, it's a daily, it's a daily um, battle. It's not going to be easy. Right. And so, you know, we, we see this daily, especially in the en energy industry, but I think there's other panelists who talked, talked about this. There's, you know, it's, the role of women in many different industries is not where it needs to be. And I think you look at, you know, the traditional forms of governance for Indigenous communities, the women, the matriarchs were very much at the center of all of that, you know, and I think we are in this transformation where that's starting to happen. So I'm, I'm really, uh, and I'm so happy to be a part of this panel because this is all a part of it, right? Yes, and I think we all have to work together so that nobody else's orientation, no other women has to go through an orientation at any work site where they're told that they can expect to be harassed at the work site. And, and that's up to all of us to change that. That's, that's, that's deeply troubling. So you, you have talked a little bit about, um, you know, how some of the stuff that you've done to advance the role of women in, ener in the energy transformation. Talk a bit more about that or when, when you have others who are students or people from your home community or other Indigenous communities, what do you tell them if they're thinking about getting into the energy industry? 
Um, I think first of all, it's you're going to need to open your mind to the incredible opportunity that there is in the energy industry, right? This is one of the most innovative and, and challenging industries that anyone can work in. And so when someone comes um, with the idea that they want to get involved, I'm like, okay, so whatever that job or that idea is, keep that open because it's probably going to grow and morph into something so much bigger. And, you know, don't, don't just stop with, um, with, you know, something that, that you think is going to be a nice cushy job. <laughs> um, I worked as a, as a, um, a recruitment officer for a college and a part of our college, we had a mind school. And so I was visiting communities all across Northern Saskatchewan and students were like, well, I want to work at the mine. I'm like, why <laughs> you know and they're like well I want to be a miner okay what does a miner do I don't know but my cousin did it so I want to do that and I'm like okay cool but let's start thinking about sciences and maths and where that can take you eventually don't you want to be you know the engineer kind of leading the show or do you want to be a part of the executive staff and I think you know we need to do a better job as communities in knowing our worth and our value and striving for that and also on the side of business when we talk about inclusion and diversity in the workplace we need to stop thinking about that lower level and we need to be preparing people to be at executive levels and have equity in projects you know so when you're talking about going into the energy industry I'm like ownership you know be a big part of the conversation and and you know, expand your mind on what that could actually look like. Because I think, especially in Indigenous communities, right, everything from, you know, our government system to our societal systems were built to oppress people and women included in that. And so now how do we break out of those confines that, you know, have placed us there? And we continue to perpetuate those, these ideas that that's normal and we need to break out of that. And, and it's just, it's so beautiful to see the absolute um, creativity and innovation that come from Indigenous youth and, and just youth in general, you know, so that is really provides some hope for me. And I think people need to just keep on running with that. I could not agree more with everything you have said. Uh, forget about putting yourself in a box that is great advice to everybody and uh, and and reach high in your dreams so thank you so much Jordan I could spend the entire day talking to you but I really appreciate your insights and now I think we'll hand it back over to Elizabeth and Linda thank you thank you so much Rona sorry for my pop on the screen I I thought Rona's uh, camera was was frozen but it was all good uh, it's your your uh, diligent moderator host being ready to <laughs> jump to action uh, thanks Linda for uh, yeah for Hi. popping back on and yeah that was great you guys oh my goodness <laughs> so much so much to work <laughs> work with there so okay so thank you, Rona and Jordan, as our last speakers, but to all of you, um, some very powerful thoughts there. So we would like to invite all of our storytellers back now to return to the screen so that we can take some questions from the audience. Um, so I'm going to ask um, Heather and Jordan, Alexandra and Kikishan to turn on your screens again. Are you there? I think so. Yeah, I'm just trying to, just trying to monitor the. the we got chat. everybody. Yeah. I think we're, we're okay. Ready we're to good. rock. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so a first question then. Uh, uh, one of the themes. Uh, I'll start it off, and then we can go to the chat. So one of the themes that really came across to me in all of your stories was this: um, that you're all individuals who are pushing boundaries within the zones of your control. Um, and so on this issue that Heather raised and, and a couple of others did too, on the underrepresentation of women in clean technology, can you give us examples of two or three tangible things to do that people on, on this call this morning can do to help um, increase that representation? Speak out about it. If you're in a meeting and you notice that there are no women, point it out. Um, 
if you are at an event where there are very few women, point it out. If a woman has been pushed aside, stand up for her and point it out in a meeting. Um, that's really what you can do on an individual level to reach a, a critical mass of, of communication towards that point. Um, absolutely, what Alex just said. Um, two weeks ago, I was in a meeting where um, only men presented and only men spoke for two and a half hours on a technical subject, um, of which is actually a thing that I lead in my in my in my work, and. Um, when a woman actually asked a question, they didn't even let that woman, me, actually ask the question. They had a man read it. So I actually sent a note to the leaders of that entire workshop. And there were like 30, 40 people on this, on this Teams call. I actually sent a note to them and basically said, yeah, you know what? I've been an engineer for 25 years, licensed professional. I've dealt with some misogyny in my life. But this particular meeting was epic. And I called, I called it out and I said, you need to send this particular note to all of these people. And I named them. <laughs> so and did um, they did did he, I, he or she do that? <laughs> they they actually did it um, because I actually had a relationship with them. So the some of the some of the guys on this call I've been working with for 20, 30 years. So I, they they had enough. They, they recognized that I wouldn't, um, I'm, I was raising a significant issue and they, ad they addressed it. Um, and I received two notes back actually. Um, but no, exactly what Alex is saying. You, when it, um, as soon as you see it, you say something. Um, and um, don't be afraid um, to ask difficult, challenging, questions that make people uncomfortable, that make people um, defensive. Um, if, if, if that's the question that's being asked and that's the reaction I get, um, I know I'm doing a good job. Okay, so Jordan, I see you shaking your head there. Call out under representation. Do you wanna comment further? Yeah, I think uh, Heather, Heather and Alex, you've got it right, the nail on the head. Um, call it out and, and ask the hard questions. You know, I think the more we ask questions, it gives people an opportunity to now think about um, their norms and why they don't challenge it themselves, you know, and not to give people the out of like, you know, here's another opportunity for you to make space, but here is another opportunity for you to make space, you know, continue to push that. Kika Shan? Yes, I absolutely agree. I can, you know, it's really sad to think about the number of times that I've had to literally say on a panel in like these huge clean tech conferences uh, and just say it on the panel that, you know, it's really strange that I'm the only woman on this panel when I know for a fact that there are so many other amazing women who are already in this field and doing some amazing work. So yeah, and I remember that when Green Hope Foundation is part of Canada Summer Jobs, when we were doing our first interviews, it was all, actually all of the, our interviewees said that I was the only female uh, person there, the interviewer, apparently all of the others in that clean tech area were men who were interviewing uh, the people, the young people there. And that was really strange uh, for me, but you know, it is true. So I do agree with that. I also think that, uh, and especially coming from an education uh, for sustainable development background, a lot of the times we've seen that teachers just uh, subconsciously to call out the, um, male students and ask them their opinions when they're talking about these sciencey things or like the technological uh, things. And I think that is something that, you know, in our education systems as well, if we bring about that change and ensure that we take that those concerted efforts to ensure that our girls are, you know, recognized and their answers are seen as valid, I think that is really, really important. And that can definitely encourage a shift in the whole clean energy sector towards, you know, different. Kashan made, a, made an interesting point, and I, I wanted to add one more thing to it. Um, for those of us that are in leadership roles um, within this community, um, I, know it's, I know it's controversial, but unfortunately we have to do the work. Um, and, and 
you have to set expectations for the organizations um, around you. Um, I'm a licensed professional engineer. So it's, it's part of my role, I believe, to ask a PEGA and Engineers Canada, show me your data. What are you doing? And when they don't show the data, to ask the question again and to encourage them to change their practices um, and think about um, the uh, inclusiveness that needs to be inherently built into um, their licensure uh, of engineers in this country. Uh, it's, it is, you, there's always a little bit of extra work and you, you're, you're just called to do it. And you know, you, you've got time, it's fine. Let's so let's riff on that really quickly, because I know we have to go to another question, but just an example Please, of yeah. that, of uh, professional regulatory bodies. So the maximum goal that Professional Engineers Ontario is willing to set right now to get women into the profession is 30%. They're not willing to go higher than that. So you really need to contact your professional body and tell them to aim higher. Let's go for 100%. <laughs> So I, I, I mean, great line of questioning, and I, I wanted to transition because I think there's some questions that really build on this that are coming uh, through the chat. So one, one question related to the fact that you know we do see some areas in in the energy sectors um, where there's a, a higher proportion of women. The example here being environmental sciences and studies um, is, is, is one that's observed. Um, but of course, there are other you know there are other areas uh, within the industry that remain. Um, you know, those gender uh, proportions remain significantly different. And so question around what, what do you think is the cause of, of that? Like sort of the, what's driving women to, to gravitate to some fields and not others. And then sort of a question building on that in terms of, you know, what advice uh, for women in, in traditional energy roles um, that might be looking to, to branch into new, new areas, new spaces, be that renewable energy or others. So great, great recommendation, Alex, about reaching out to those professional organizations and, and, and pushing them to, to, to aim higher uh, and do better. Uh, other thoughts on this in terms of, you know, why some areas um, may have, may see more women gravitate than others and, and what, what can we do, what advice would you give to women who might be looking to, to shift into, into different areas of the energy sector, um, perhaps away from traditional and in, into some of the, whether that's uh, renewables or, or other areas, digitization, et cetera. Um, well, I can go. Um... Uh, I'd say that right now we're in a place where um, the there's that saying that the last 10% takes 90% of the effort. And um, we the previous generations of female engineers have made a lot of inroads in moving towards that equality. But the, the things that are um, uh, causing women to either leave technical professions after they've been in them for a while or enter them in the first place are really, it's the small stuff now. And you, it's really death by a thousand pinpricks rather than, you know, it's usually not really blatant um, sexism, although sometimes it definitely can be um, these days. And so I would say that um, we really need to, first of all, bring men into this conversation. I think that um, at the beginning, you mentioned that 70% of the attendees were female. Um, from my perspective, that's not very helpful. Like we, uh, women already know what it's like to be in STEM and uh, uh, what our problems are. And the real work that needs to be done is communicating that and having the, the male portion of those um, professions really um, be able to empathize with our struggles and use events like this to understand our experience in those professions. And I, I don't really know what it's going to take to get them here because they usually don't show up to events that have women in the title, but uh, that, that I think is a really big step. I so Alex, you, you think maybe we need to have a series on men and energy transformation here too, men and women in energy transformation. Um, yes, maybe. Yeah, I think I think Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say, I think it goes down to, you know, our understanding of systems and the foundation of organizations and workplace and the industry as a whole. I think we need to start breaking things down foundationally, right? If we have systems that are built by men, those systems are built for men. And so we need to start breaking down, you know, looking at, at um, individual organizations and, okay, so, you know, what are our values? 
what, what, how do we create a safe space and an environment for women and all people to feel like they have value and they have a voice and, you know, we're moving forward with them and not that it's, it's an additional add on piece, like, oh, right now we need to like make it a, a, an initiative this year to work on diversity and inclusion. Like, no, this is the, about the very foundation of our organization and that's where it needs to start. And that's the difficult work, right? That it, it's going to take a major overhaul of things that goes right down to our government and, and, you know, and you look at workplace policies, you look at legislation, all of that, it's not built for us. So how could it ever work for us? And that needs to change. Uh, yeah, I agree with that completely. And, you know, it's, uh, there are so many instances where I've seen that, you know, that tokenistic diversity and inclusion now after a lot of people, you know, rightfully calling uh, the institutions out and they just have that in place. But at the same time, nothing has really changed because, uh, you know, as you said, Jordan, it the system is still the same and it's just like this add on and we really need to bring about that whole shift uh, in like just everywhere to make sure that we do include every single person uh, in a holistic way, not in a tokenistic way. And, uh, you know, for the advice part on uh, that, I think that as uh, women and girls in this field, it might seem really daunting at first to take that first step into moving into the clean energy sector, but, you know, just really go for it. And if we don't find uh a place for ourselves over there, then, you know, we create a new space where we can really engage everyone. And I think this pandemic has really get opened our eyes to how we can create new spaces of creating a new normal. And I think that would actually work where it does not, it's not like this hierarchical system, but more a network of people, like-minded people who are passionate about creating a more sustainable world. And another uh, point I also wanted to make about why uh, this sort of inequality happens in the clean energy uh, sector, I would once again go back to the lack of opportunities for girls in STEM starting from right from the schooling and education system. And even if they are given uh, the opportunities to you know, access STEM education and higher education, they're still not given the same uh, kind of uh, preference to be there uh, and learn more about it. And even if they do have that, they're not given the job. So I think then uh, that again connects back to my other point about creating our own spaces and making sure that then we can welcome everyone in there. Jordan, I, I wanted to build on the, the comment, um, you know, that that you, you mentioned earlier, and again, that, um, you know, these can't be, um, you know, today we're going to focus, or this year we're going to have this, you know, this initiative on diversity inclusion. This is, you know, sort of basic what needs to happen within our organizations. And, um, you know, a, a specific example around that um, is, is that, you know, for, for three years, there's been a report, um, the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, um, that has, ha that made, you know, some very strong recommendations on, on areas um, in resource extraction and, and, and energy in terms of, of calls, um, you know, for, for safety and security of, of an Indigenous, of Indigenous women. So points right back to, you know, the first story that you told about um, being told, you know, you're not going to feel safe here. Well, that's, that's not good enough. That should be fundamental. Mental to, to business practice and uh, as well as recommendations on, on, on governments um, uh, and, and bodies to, to mandate, evaluate, approve, you know, ensure that, that gender-based analysis is included in, in projects. Um, impact benefit agreements being included. So I know um, not not asking you to address each each of these um, recommendations necessarily, but question being, and, and I want to pose the question to, to all the women on the screen is, have we seen have we seen improvement? Have we seen change? Have we seen shifts in action um, related specifically to those recommendations in, in the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls uh, report? Um, but I, I would ask the question sort of across uh, our women, are you, are you seeing things shift? Are we seeing improvements or is there just so much more work to do? Um, and Jordan, maybe I could start with you, but, but would really like to hear from, from all the panelists. Yeah, I, I definitely think um, 
I, I see improvement. I, I am an optimist, however. <laughs> um, so I do see improvement, um, you know, and, and that being in that Indigenous women's voices are being amplified. And you see this in, you know, now in this digital world that we, we exist in this little box that I'm in right now. But in the world of social media, you know, there's a lot of young Indigenous women that you know, now are taking up space on, on billboards and, and um, everywhere in the social media world, you know, and not that that has a, a, a real direct connection to the energy industry, but, but it does, you know, for other women to be able to identify and now see power and identity being represented in the mainstream. And I think those practices will continue to snowball. And I think, um, especially with Indigenous energy projects, a lot of the, the people that I work up with in those spaces are women, you know, and so now I'm having more of an opportunity to be mentored by these women. And, you know, for me, that's super uplifting, and I'm able to do my job a little bit better and, and, and be able to now you know, pay that forward and be that mentor for, for the next generation of, of young women coming up in, in this industry. And so I, I do see progress, I think, um, more at, at, a, at a professional level um, in terms of, of, you know, corporate involvement in MMIW initiatives, that definitely needs to change. You know, I think we have things like the TRC's call to action and, and uh, the, the MMIW calls to justice. And even you look at something as, as broad as, as UNDRIP, you know, I think that because their recommendations or because their calls to action, I don't think organizations are seeing that, okay, well, we're not mandated to do this, but you are, right? Your corporate values mandate you to address those. And we need to start following that and people are not. And so what are those ways? You need to ask your community. You need to ask the people that you're impacting. And those need to be a part of the conversations as much as our, you know, our environmental assessments and our our impact assessments with communities. We need to start asking, how is this affecting young women in your communities? And how can we do better? Heather, you posed the question, why are, why are women called to accept that lack of personal and psychological safety? Um, you know, is, is that a condition changing? of their employment? Yeah. It's, it's not okay. Um, I'm, I'm probably, I'm called to be hopeful and I'm generally an optimist like Jordan, but I'm also a bit bruised and scarred. Um, so I'm gonna say a bunch of things. They're not necessarily gonna be connected ideas, but we'll, we'll, we'll put it there. Um, the first concept, racism is not an opinion. It is an economic issue, okay? And when we start talking about um, yet another report on the perceptions of uh, black and indigenous citizens in this country, it's the problem is not the perceptions of black and indigenous citizens in this country. The problem is the systemic racism they're experiencing that causes them to have the perceptions. Do not fix the messenger, fix the problem. We need to get to a place where we're not afraid of who we are, our history, where we're going and the data that represents it. We need to collect race-based data across the board. In healthcare, we need to collect race-based data in science and technology, engineering uh, and, and, and mathematics. We need to collect race-based data in arts and culture across the board. Um, when I think about um, being an engineer, I have an annual survey that tells me why, my, my, how much less I make for being a woman. I do not have a survey that tells me how much less I make for being a black woman. And I'm sure that it's actually there somewhere, but for some reason, we're afraid to actually collect that information. We don't seem to care how disease manifests in other people of color. 
Why is it that Black women have a 40% higher rate of death and mortality from breast cancer? That's a reality in Canada and nobody seems to care. So it's a fundamental thing where we need to start thinking about the other and stop othering the other. Thanks, Heather. Alex? I wanted to uh, comment. Oh, oh, Alex, can go ahead. Oh, oh I was just going to say, I can anyone follow that up? That was an excellent speech. Um, <laughs> so, Kehaka Sean, if you have something to add, by all means, go ahead. Well, I absolutely <laughs> agree with that. I think, you know, there for so long, we've only addressed these uh, specific issues in with a very silos based approach where it's like gender equality, racism, uh, and like, it's just so separate, but at the same time, it's not separate. There are all of these intersectionalities that have always existed. And it's really important that we take that into account. Uh, I mean, now is a really good place uh, to start and ensure that we have that uh, disaggregated data that really takes into account uh, all of these intersectionalities so that we are able to get the the true picture of what is actually going on on the ground. And a lot of the times in uh, my work as well, we've seen that all of these reports that are made are very top down and don't actually take into account the lived experiences of the people they're reporting about. So I think that is something that needs to change uh, as well. And I think that, you know, this goes for the clean energy sector and any other sector as well. If we bring about that kind of change, I think we would be able to, you know, get a better overview of what, how we can address the problem, and then we can go about actually, you know, bringing about positive change. We probably have time for just one or two more questions. This is so powerful and incredible. I, uh, like Rona mentioned earlier, I could just, I could spend all day with this group of amazing women. Linda, I don't know if there's a, a particular question um, you wanted to pose to one or one or more of our panelists. And then I, I have a, a, a wrap up rapid fire question. I'll ask each of you before we, uh, we give you a break and let you take a rest off screen. Linda, is there okay. one you wanted to pose? Okay, well, I just wanted to call out one, one point that Jordan made and it came up here in the chat too. What does effective engagement on energy transformation look like? So I just wanna throw that out for a deeper dive to all of our, what does effective engagement? I mean, we already know that there's um, 20 to 25% of Canadians who are deeply engaged in climate and energy issues the transition to net zero. There's about 40% who think it's important, but aren't quite sure about the how. What advice do you have for engaging with that 40%? Um, I think um, building on some, like a bunch of stuff we've already talked about in this conversation, I think we are living under a paradigm of STEM supremacy, where we, we really put STEM um, activities and thought at the, the very top of our decision-making when it comes to energy transformation. But as Heather mentioned, um, not only do um, gender and intersectionality issues exist in STEM, they also exist in the arts. And the example I have of that is at the University of Toronto where I just graduated from. Um, they, they are hosting their first ever female PhD student in jazz studies in the music department. So it really is a across the board issue. And I really think that we need to understand that and bring in some more, let's say less hard STEM decision-making and maybe have something like social science informed engineering decisions or um, that really really take into account that there, there's more than just, you know, counting the molecules moving from point A to point B that um, will make sure that the solutions we come up with are more, more holistic and take into account a lot more parts of our economy and social structure than previously done, which was just, you know, a, an energy in energy out calculation. I think it's about changing the goals and the metrics um, around the energy transformation. So, you know, when we talk about, you know, something really attractive like grid modernization, um, we, we, we talk about a safety and reliability and security of, of energy supply. But we also now need to talk about sustainability. We need to talk about energy access. We need to talk about energy equity. Um, so changing the goals, changing the metrics, um, and, the, and the relative value um, of those metrics in what we've traditionally, in what we've traditionally done, I think can make um, it engaging for others 
um, because for, for the folks that aren't 100% engaged in the energy transformation, um, because they, I think it's because they want to understand the impact. They want to understand how it will um, bring them prosperity. They want to understand how it will bring their family um, a healthy and sustainable future. And if we, can, if we can have a way to communicate that effectively by having different metrics and different values and different goals, um, that may be a way to, uh, to inspire that um, engagement. Jordan? Yeah, I think, um, and when I'm speaking of engagement, I'm, I'm thinking from, from all levels, right? Whether it's, you know, an, an interpersonal connection with, with someone, you know, at the workplace, how are we engaging with those people to, you know, those formal processes of including voices into decision-making processes. Um, and I think we need to go into those with a very unbiased mindset and, you know, I think when we do research and we lead discussion, depending where it's coming from, there's a reason, right? There's a motive and then there's a follow-up action. And it's typically already predetermined what that needs to be. And so we need to change that process. And I think I'd like to, I'd like to continue to play with this more, but um, engagement coming more from community and less to community, you know, I think we need to start leading our own engagement processes and, and, you know, I'd love to see women from my community or, you know, my, my reach to be able to say, okay, how are we being involved? What is, what are the barriers, you know, and not so we give organizations an easy pathway, um, to be able to say they've done engagement and whatnot, but because that's what, what it ultimately will do. Um, but so that it's unbiased and it comes from a very, um, natural place. And I think, um, you know, as we move forward through the, the energy um, transformation, we need to also really look at what is already provided, right? And, and when we do engagement, are we just hearing people or are we actually listening? And I think Indigenous communities, and, and you know, that's a big part of my background and my passion, those voices have shared where the inequities lie. And it's a matter of actually listening and actioning what those voices have shared, right? The, the calls to action exist, the calls to justice exist, under exists, but do organizations actually implement and follow through? And that's what we need to see. And that's how you'll start to empower people is if you actually listen and, and action and put some, some worth behind um, how they see this happening. Thanks, Jordan. Okay, Agisha, I'd love your thoughts on this and then we'll do a quick quick wrap up. I'm, I'm playing fast and loose with the agenda. I've gone longer in the Q&A than we were supposed to. Linda, thanks for hanging with me, but I just this is just so powerful. I'd, we'd rather hear from you than, than Linda and I. So let's keep going. So okay, Agisha, I'd love your answer on what does engagement look like? And then we'll do a final wrap up rapid fire question. For sure. You know, sustainability has three pillars, the economy, society, and the environment. And it is time that we recognize the interconnections over there and understand that these three pillars are really present in whatever sector we're in, wherever we're working in, whichever level of society that we're working in. And this issue of social injustice, it's something that is cross-cutting. So the actions needed to address it must be similarly cross-cutting as well. And that definitely applies here uh, to the clean energy sector. And I would also say that we need an empathy-based approach right from childhood towards addressing these challenges, not just you know, uh, a, a pitying or victimizing uh, certain communities, but actually uh, recognizing someone else's problem as your own. And then you know, to echo what my fellow panelists have said, walking the talk and ensuring that we're actually able to bring about uh, change. And, to reiterate my point about education, if we actually ensure that our children learn this empathy for people and planet right from the childhood, not something that they're told you know, when they're entering the workforce, 
and that they're taught empathy in literally every single subject that they study, I think we would be able to see um, a quicker transition and quicker and more just transition towards a more sustainable and equal world. Um, thank you all so much, Heather, uh, Alexandra, Jordan, Kekisha, thank you for joining us. Um, just by way of a, a wrap up question, um, one of the things I love about this group is while well, you've all taken the time and, and invested some real you know, emotional energy in sharing some very personal stories um, and identifying some of the real barriers and challenges you've faced, You've all also in your own way shared that you are optimists and you are hopeful and um, and that's what this is all about right that's what transformation is all about so I thought if we could wrap up with like rapid fire kind of like one to five words, what are you hopeful about what makes you hopeful um, for the future. Um, and I, I hate I don't want to put anyone in the spot but Jordan you mentioned you are an optimist you are hopeful so what's your what's your rapid fire, what are you hopeful about. The innovation that comes with young minds. Awesome. Love it. Alex, what are you hopeful for? Um, I'm hopeful for um, our, that the, the, I'm hopeful about the way the election turned out and that we get to continue down the path of uh, our plans, um, even though they, they could always be more aggressive. Um, and I, I hope that that turns out well. That was way more than five words, I'm sorry. That's okay, love it. Okay, Akisha, what are you hopeful for? I am hopeful for uh, the empathy that our a lot of people are currently demonstrating during the pandemic. I know that's more than four, five words right now, but yes, I think the pandemic has given us the opportunity to reflect and learn and I'm that gives me hope for the future. Love it. Heather, what are you hopeful for? Um, creativity ingenuity, innovation, hard work. Well done, five words. You had the longest to think about it, but yeah. well I did. and I had fingers to count on. <laughs> well done. Um, thank you so much, all of you. Amazing contributions uh, to this dialogue. Um, you can take a break and flip your cameras off, but please don't go away. Um, and for our participants, this next um, portion of our agenda is, is critically important to the success of, of the rest of the, the dialogue um, that we're planning uh, over, the, over the coming months. Um, so we want to once again hear from you. Um, bear with us, got a few questions we want to pose. Um, your responses and input, again, critical to shaping this series. So stick with us, share your input. So to start off, I'm going to ask you to use, once again, use the chat, open-ended question. Um, based on all the great stuff you've heard today, what do you think are the benefits of having increased representation of women and other underrepresented groups in Canada's ener energy transformation? So please use the chat to share. Don't, no wrong ideas. Don't think too much. Don't think too hard. Give us your responses. Get into the chat. What are the benefits of seeing increased representation of women uh, and other underrepresented groups in our energy transformation? will be better and faster. Love it, love it. Um, you know, thinking of some of the comments we, we heard from our speakers, diversity of thought, uh, innovation from young people, um, absolutely, economic diversity, empathy and equity, energy and love, identifying more barriers and opportunities to uh, adopt that transformation. Normalization of women and diversity. Leading the way for, um, for underdeveloped countries. Highest voted answer was a just transition. Nobody left behind. Amazing, thank you. Keep those responses coming. Linda, over to you for our next uh, engagement question. Okay, so thanks everyone. Um, I think we all know there are important benefits and as Heather and some of our panelists uh, spoke, we need to define them to be able to measure them and to uh, be able to assess our progress against them with, around specific goals. So um, I, I just want to, as you know, another question here will help, uh, help us um, uh, create what's gonna happen in the next element in this series and the next events in this series. Um, as you know, this is just the first of four dialogues that we will be convening 
Our next event will be in November. It will occur shortly after the UN Climate Summit in Glasgow, known as COP26. And it will dig into some of the barriers to gender equity on energy issues. Um, then our third event will align with the Globe Forum in Vancouver in February, 2022. Uh, and it's flagship women's luncheon. This may be one that we'll be able to do hybrid in person and online. And the focus on that discussion will be on identifying solutions and connecting women with opportunities in the energy economy. And then our fourth and final event will be late spring 2022. We'll wrap things up, highlighting some key learnings and next steps. Um, so shortly you'll see a, a poll come onto your screen. Uh, help, us, uh, help us understand better what you'd like to see as part of these next three dialogues. Um, so the questions are, um, what would you like to see in these dialogues? Identifying barriers for women in energy transformation, discussing possible public policy solutions to removing barriers. We didn't get into that as much today. Uh, discussing possible workplace solutions to removing barriers, examples of career pathways in energy transformation. We heard four great examples uh, today and we're gonna have an online platform that may produce uh, another hundred examples over the course of this series uh, and networking opportunities. So if you wanna take a a moment and just give us some feedback on what you'd like to see next, that would be really helpful. Yeah, yeah. some great sort of early barrier and identification and, and solutions that we heard from our storytellers today, but man, lots of great stuff to, to dig into uh, in the next three dialogues. Um, maybe uh, we can flash those poll results up once we, uh, once we have a quorum to see what, um, what's of interest. Okay. Awesome. So right around a hundred responses there and um, examples of career pathways being um, tied with workplace solutions, but, but interest across the board on those, uh, on those key issues. Awesome. Um, so thanks for those responses. Uh, this next one is again for you to use the chat uh, to share in. So following up on our, our starting poll, where we asked about, um, you know, your sense of your organization's commitment um, to supporting gender equity in the workplace. I, I want to give you the chance now to, sh to share in the chat um, with the group, what, what's one action that your organization is taking to better support gender equity or an example of an action that you've seen taken um, by an organization um, can be very specific. I saw some comments earlier in the chat about paternity leave being, being really key uh, to allowing um, uh, for, for um, that diversity of, of participation uh, in, in the energy sectors. Um, so what would be um, an action that your organization is taking or an action that you're aware of big or small um, that can better support gender equity in the workplace. Um, please jump in and, and use the chat. Conducting a diversity inclusion survey to understand better within the organization. Awesome. Hybrid work arrangements. Yeah, we've seen so much more of that with COVID. Scholarships for women, fantastic. Mentorship, that came up a number of times throughout the, the dialogue this morning. Pemba is signed up to equal by 30. Absolutely great initiative. Awesome. Thanks. Keep those, keep those examples coming. We want to know about them. Um, Linda, over, over to you. Okay, well, everyone, we're coming to the end here of this part of the program. And I, I just want to revisit for everyone the fact that from the beginning of this initiative, as we were putting it together, both Globe and Pembina have always wanted this dialogue series to be about more than just a conversation. If we'll get together one morning, have an interesting conversation, and then that's it, I think, as Heather noted in the chat. So how do we keep this going? So as part of it, one of the ways we're doing that is we're doing a series over the course of the next year. But another way that we're doing that with this, uh, with this project is we're building an online platform that can serve as a repository for all of the learnings we'll be gathering in the coming months from various sources. And we are partnering with the creators of the Energy File websites to use something that they're calling the collection science platform to build out this important resource. 
So the, there will be a digital component to this series and it will uh, not only contain the profiles of up to 100 women energy leaders and innovators, but it will also hopefully be able to connect users with practical tools and resources on training, education and career development. If you, uh, I think up on the screen right now, you should see an example of what that online platform look like. looks like. We have over a dozen profiles up there so far that you'll be able to go in and take a look at. And following this dialogue, we'll be launching a process for open nominations to build this database out further and, uh, and further develop this tool. So the poll that's about to appear on your screen next is to collect your input on what would be most useful to see on this portal. And so here are the questions. Uh, do you want profiles and stories of women in transformation? We can, we can hold up to 100 on this, profile, uh, on this portal. Uh, career advice, resources for building gender equity programs in your organization, research and white papers on the issues that we've been uh, discussing, uh, and networking tools. Um, give, give us an idea of what you'd like to see us emphasize in this platform as we build it out. We should have that final poll, just asking uh, our participants what they'd like to see. Do we have that one to share? And Karina, thanks for asking the question. You are the first, um, you are the first to uh, get access to this platform. It is live now. Uh, Sarah Nason, our, our amazing colleague from Pembina has just shared in the chat. Um, the access to that, uh, that platform that we've just begun to build out. And as Linda mentioned, uh, we're going to be opening up, um, we're going to be opening up again, um, a nomination process uh, to add individuals. So great to see those results in terms yeah. of what people would like and to hear. And be able to uh, access, access it through the globe page for women yes. in transformation as, as we build it out. Today is just the first day it's been available with a, a 12 uh, initial stories on there, including, I think, the stories of some of our speakers today. You bet, exciting. Okay, Elizabeth, are we kind of there? I think we are, Linda. <laughs> yes, we did, okay. <laughs> I'm not as used to this online stuff as you are, but I've, I've hung in there. So I hope everyone has enjoyed the experience today. Um, thanks to all of our speakers and sponsors. Thanks to the hardworking teams at Globe and Pemina who, who have been involved every step of the way in putting all this information and people together. But most of all, a big thank you to our audience for your engagement, your questions, your input, and your interest in the issues that we are going to explore in this series. Don't go away yet, though. Um, the formal part of our program is coming to a close, um, but we're excited to now offer you the opportunity to meet and engage with some of your fellow attendees on these critical topics. Um, so to do this, uh, to allow for that engagement, we're going to move into a new Zoom meeting that will allow us to get into those small group conversations. I know you're all busy people. I know that it's tempting to skip out on this part of the program and go check your emails uh, and go and, and get back to the the, the some of the core business of the day, but I urge you, don't skip out. These small group conversations are where the magic happens. It's where the ideas are born. It's where new collaborations and partnerships are initiated. Um, so once we wrap here, you can access the networking porking networking portion, excuse me, of the of this uh, session using the link that uh, my Globe colleagues are going to share in the chat. Um, you also should have received an email during the dialogue uh, providing you a new link, again, uh, that will match the one shared in the chat, uh, to join those networking sessions. And once we're engaged in those networking groups, uh, we'll ask you to think about the following question. So what was the most important thing that you heard today? Um, what speakers would you like to hear from at future uh, Women in Energy Transformation Dialogues? Specific individuals or, or types of speakers, um, whatever input you want to discuss. And, and what's the likelihood you'd attend a future dialogue and why? Now, 
We want you to have these conversations. This, these are suggestions for the basis of the networking rooms. The good news is we're gonna be following up next week with a feedback survey. And those questions will mirror the ones we're suggesting you chat about today. So you're gonna have a chance to capture and feedback uh, some of that discussion that you have in the breakout sessions. And that will help again, inform uh, future dialogues and, and how we put those together. So please, uh, click on the link in the chat. Once we wrap here, click on the link in the email uh, that you received. Um, thank you all again for being here. As we mentioned, our next dialogue in the series is coming up at the end of November. Watch your inboxes for the opportunity to register for that. Um, we are wrapping it up here in the formal part. We will see you over in the networking session. Thank you so much.